Welcome to Kids Considered, where two pediatricians discuss children's health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Vanderlist. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. All right, so today on the podcast, we're going to cover, I think it's like considered somewhat of a controversial topic. So like sex education or gun control or <laughs> animal rights? Um, Not exactly. So every year when I go to the American Academy of Pediatrics National Conference, there's always protesters outside rallying against a very common in-office medical procedure. Do you know what I'm referring to? It must be vaccination, right? <laughs> These days, that is a bigger one. But historically, it's actually been male circumcision. Hmm. So while I was a little hesitant at first to take on this topic, I think I get so many questions from families about circumcision, especially, you know, in those first few weeks of life after a a male infant is born. Um, I'm sure lots of our listeners have questions as well. So I think it is an important topic. Yeah, absolutely. This is a big decision that parents have to face early in their child's life, and they have to weigh the medical information from their physician with their own personal, religious, cultural, and ethical belief systems. So let's start by reviewing what actually is circumcision. What is this procedure? Right. So male circumcision is the surgical procedure of removing some or all of the foreskin of the penis. In the United States, it's most commonly performed in the neonatal period within the first month of life. Although in other cultures, it can be done later in life. So, for example, in southern Africa, it's completed as a ritual to signify the transition to manhood. Jewish and Islamic faiths typically perform circumcision as a religious act also. In the U.S., the most recent data from the National Center for Health Statistics estimates that somewhere around 60 percent of newborn boys undergo circumcisions, but rates have actually been declining over the past decade. So why why is that? Why are rates declining? I think I'm kind of just guessing here, but I think it's a combination of things. People are drifting away from religion in in some ways, um, spending more time thinking about like bodily autonomy and ethical implications of like the baby not being able to make that decision themselves. And I also think there's just increased acceptance given that half of the population is not circumcised. I seem to remember that the American Academy of Pediatrics, our professional organization, that they came out with a position statement on circumcision. Yep, they do have one. It was a task force that was assembled to kind of review all of the data surrounding the health benefits, the risks. They last met in 2012. And so if policies are not revised within five years, they actually expire the policy statement. So since they have not met to review this data, it's considered expired at this point. But the last policy statement, which was in 2012, and by the AAP endorsed by the College of Gynecologists, reviewed the data and concluded that the preventative health benefits of elective circumcision of male newborns outweighed the risk of the procedure. They said, however, that the health benefits were not great enough to recommend routine circumcision for all male newborns and that it remains at the discretion of the, the guardian of the child. And they reinforced in this policy that it's the physician's responsibility to really counsel the parents about the health benefits and the risks of circumcision in a fair and unbiased manner. So that position that is not official anymore, but it seems like it's pretty logical to me when I'm hearing you talk about that. Let's go into more discussion about the risks and the benefits that you mentioned of circumcision. So when and where does a neonatal circumcision typically take place? So it's pretty variable. In many places, it will actually be performed in the hospital before you're discharged. So after you deliver, but before you're discharged, maybe on day one or two of life. Um, It may be done by a pediatric physician or sometimes in some places, the obstetrician, the MD who delivered you will do it. And other times, it's done in the primary care office after discharge, but before the baby is a month old. So the reasons that a circumcision may be delayed would be for illness in the baby, if they're not feeding well, if they're losing weight, or if they've got jaundice and need the billy lights, um, so any, any, any of those reasons. Absolutely. Because it's not considered a medically necessary procedure, we want to make sure that baby is healthy and thriving from all other standpoints before we would consider doing a circumcision. 
So if a parent is on the fence about whether or not to circumcise their child, how do you counsel them? How do you walk them through the risks and benefits of the procedure? And I imagine that sometimes the mother and father might have different views on it also. Yeah, totally. And and just to be upfront, there's actually some pretty solid data to show that parental decisions about circumcision are shaped more from their family, their social, cultural influences than by discussion with medical clinicians. But of course, nonetheless, it's super important to have these discussions. There was also a different survey that showed that the most important factors when we talk to parents who are deciding are the perceived health benefits to the child, which we'll go into, and then whether or not the father was circumcised. Because, you know, you always want your kid to look like you. So it's really the the family's experience with circumcision is really a key here. Yeah, so let's talk about the benefits first. So circumcision in the neonatal period reduces the risk of urinary tract infections. And and this kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, because there's less bacteria getting trapped under the foreskin. And then, then, then if there's less bacteria there, there's less chance of it potentially making its way up the urethra into the bladder and then causing infection. Right. Luckily, UTIs, urinary tract infections, in male infants are uncommon whether they're circumcised or they're not circumcised. So in a review of 12 studies that looked in data over 400,000 male infants um, under one year of age, circumcision seemed to reduce the risk of UTI by almost 90%. Mm-hmm. So just to give it numbers, um, you know, 7 to 14 of 1,000 cir- uncircumcised male infants will develop a urinary tract infection during the first year of life. And that's compared to one to two out of a thousand circumcised male infants. So, you know, that's about a seven plus fold decrease in urinary tract infections in circumcised male infants. There's likely more benefit for infants who may have an underlying defect of the urinary tract. So some families may recognize those as having something called vesiculourethral reflux or posterior urethral valves. Because when you have this underlying anatomic abnormality, they're already at increased risk for UTI as opposed to sort of the general population if you don't have that. And they can have more complications associated if they do have an infection. And so they may benefit the most from having a circumcision. So there's also a reduction in penile cancer as well as cervical cancer in the female partners of men who are circumcised. So luckily, penile cancer is really rare. It's extremely rare. The incidence is less than one per 100,000 males. But it's important to note that there will be limited new studies since now we have widespread use of HPV vaccine. And that's been this huge breakthrough for reducing HPV-associated cancers in both men and women, including penile cancer and cervical cancer. So widespread HPV vaccination may reduce the prevalence of HPV-related disease, and that may mean that the benefits of circumcision and prevention of these cancers might be less just because there's less cancers overall. Absolutely. Circumcision also reduces the risk of of inflammation of the head of the penis and the foreskin and also retractile disorders. And I think it, it makes sense to go into this a little bit more because, to be honest, these types of things are like seem to be the biggest issues um, and the the reason that most parents will go on to have a circumcision later in life, like later past the newborn period. Um, and so we can highlight some of the normal anatomy and the normal penile development and, and foreskin retraction here. Mm-hmm. So balanitis and postitis are terms which refer to inflammation of the glands and the foreskin of the penis. And this is caused from a variety of things, including bacteria getting trapped, frequent touching or rubbing the area, and increased wetness that can lead to irritation of these areas. Yeah, so this will frequently present as pain, redness in the area, possible swelling, and and potentially some discharge. Most of the time, it can be treated easily with just gentle cleaning of the area, soaks or like sitz baths, and sometimes applying a topical antibiotic ointment. Um, Occasionally, it will require an oral antibiotic as well. Now, both of these conditions are more common in uncircumcised children. Now, when we mention the risk of the retractile disorders, you may be thinking, um, duh, obvious. If you don't remove the foreskin, then of course this is going to be more more common, right? Mm-hmm. 
But there are two conditions we refer to when we discuss the foreskin and potential retractile issues, phimosis and paraphimosis. So phimosis is when the foreskin covers the head of the penis and cannot be retracted or pulled back behind the glands or the head of the penis. And this is completely normal and expected in young children. We refer to it as physiologic phimosis. In a young child, we, we don't expect the foreskin to be able to retract. In fact, only 50% of newborns can have the foreskin retracted far enough to see the urethral opening, the hole that the urine comes out. And as a little boy who's uncircumcised grows and gets older, the adhesions that are between the foreskin and the penis start to break down naturally with the help of like erections that they have over time and other natural processes. So by the time a child usually is around three, about 90% of them will have retractile foreskin. For some boys, this is later and, and it really isn't an issue. We usually just monitor it over time. But occasionally, if it doesn't, by the time they're older, they're having a lot of pain, inflammation, then that can lead to parents or the child getting a circumcision later in life. All parents need to do in a child with the foreskin is to clean the area with soap and water, and then they can push back um, on the area very gently, never to the point that it causes pain. Parents should never forcibly retract their child's foreskin because that can result in a very dangerous condition called paraphimosis. Right, so that's when the foreskin gets stuck behind the glands of the penis, and it can reduce or cut off blood flow to the area and causes significant pain, swelling. It's an emergency, really. It needs to be addressed right away. So that's like an emergency room visit. So we strayed a little bit off course, but I think it's easy for parents to understand that the risk of these retractile disorders is greatly reduced in a circumcised child. There are also some studies to show that circumcision protects against some sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, HPV, and probably some of the herpes viruses, um, HSV type 2. It does not protect against infection from other common STDs like gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis. And it's also important to note that many of these studies were performed in Africa, where there is a higher incidence of HIV. And so then we'd see more benefit um, in that situation. So now that we've reviewed the benefits, let's talk about the risks of the procedure. Most of these are going to revolve around the immediate complications of the procedure and then some downstream or later complications. Overall, circumcisions are a safe, very low-risk procedure, especially if done within the first month of life. One study showed that the rate of complications in the first month after the procedure was approximately 0.2%. The most common risks of the procedure are bleeding. Of course, that's increased if there's any family history of bleeding disorders or for some reason your child didn't get their vitamin K shot when they were born, which they should absolutely always get. Another risk would be a cosmetic outcome that the family is not happy with, usually due to removal of too little foreskin. And then like with any procedure um, where you're making an incision, there are risks for pain infection, or injury to other part of the penis. And there is a risk for developing re-adhesions or scarring. Some people wonder about the risk for later in life for sexual function or pleasure. In a review of 36 studies, circumcision was not associated with decreased sexual arousal, sensitivity, or satisfaction. Although, of course, like, you only know it one way, kind of. So mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how they got this data, um, but not something that you have to worry about. Yeah, I guess if you really wanted to do that study, you'd have to do, like, sexually active adults and do like a before and after circumcision study, huh? <laughs> nobody wants to volunteer for that study. And nobody's volunteering for that, right? So that's not going to get done. So let's say a family comes to you and you review all the risks and the benefits of the procedure and they decide they'd like to proceed with the circumcision. What's the procedure like and what can parents expect in the healing process after it's done? Yeah, so even before the circumcision occurs, your physician will examine your baby. There are a few penile abnormalities that are contraindications, meaning we would not perform a circumcision on a baby that had these things. The most common is something called hypospadias. It's basically where that little pee hole is not in the proper position at the top of the head of the penis. Sometimes it can be a little bit lower. 
And the urologists, the experts that correct it, actually use the foreskin in that repair. So that's something we would not want to circumcise. Some other ones are, are penile torsion. So if the penis is twisted um, or something called a cordy, again, the, cir- the, the foreskin may be used in the future if a surgical repair is needed. And so in those cases, it may still be okay, but usually you'll check in with a urologist before it's done. Um, as long as the anatomy is normal, then an in-office circumcision can be safely performed. Now, there's a few different devices that can be used to remove the foreskin. I remember from my training, I think back then we were always using something called a GOMCO, but now there's, there's more kinds, right? Most offices will still use the GOMCO. That's what we use in our office. Um, In my opinion, they're probably like the safest and they were designed specifically for circumcision. There's also something called a Plastibel and a Mogan clamp. So the GOMCO and the Mogan completely remove the foreskin during the procedure in the office. So baby will just go home with maybe some gauze wrapped around the tip, but no foreskin left. The GOMCO provides protection for the head of the penis, so there's a little bell that covers that. While the Mogan was described by one of my mentors to me as like a little foreskin guillotine, it's it's quicker, but I think it just kind of like cuts it off really fast. It potentially poses more risk to the surrounding area because there's not protection. The Plastibel you do a procedure where um, you remove part of the foreskin and then you leave like a little ring of plastic still attached and it essentially performs a crush injury to the foreskin. So it will kind of cut off the blood supply. It stays on for a few days and then it falls off on its own. To be honest, I have no experience at all with the Mogan or the Plastibel, so I can't really speak to them, but I I do use the Gomco in, in my practice. So I think I might have done one circumcision with the GOMCO during my training. I don't, I, maybe I did more, I, but I don't think I did too many. But you've got experience with this. So what is, what, what's it like doing the GOMCO procedure? Yeah. So typically we'll, we'll bring a baby back to the procedure room. They're strapped down on like a little, I call it the baby straight jacket, but it's they're strapped down on a little board so that they don't kick and move around, right? So that you can make sure that, that no injury happens. Um, most physicians will perform a penile nerve block to reduce pain. I think this is a really, really important part of the procedure to minimize discomfort in the babies. A super small needles used to inject lidocaine into the base of the penis. And, and so it's kind of think about like when you go to the dentist and you get dental anesthesia, we can completely numb that area that we're working on. In addition to the lidocaine or the nerve block, we use a pacifier with some sugar water during the procedure, which there's good data to show that this also eases pain in babies. And I'd just like to mention that these are all great advances since I was in training that nobody ever did that. Nobody ever did the nerve block. Nobody, we didn't know about the sugar water and how that that was, it seems so simple, but that's really effective in terms of pain control. That's something that's also used sometimes during immunizations. We talked more about that in our pain control episode, these different methods of pain control. Absolutely. And so after that, the area is cleaned with betadine, which is an antiseptic solution. And then you you create a completely sterile area, meaning that you put sterile drapes around them. You use sterile gloves to make sure that you reduce that infection risk. The layers of the foreskin are then separated um, with a little probe and a slit is made down the center of the foreskin. The gomco clamp is applied. You cover the head of the penis and then you... Um, you use a scalpel to remove the foreskin. The whole procedure is is pretty quick. It usually takes about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and then after we're done, usually the penis is wrapped with a little bit of gauze and that stays on for maybe a day or so. And then it's recommended to liberally apply Vaseline with every diaper change for a week or so just to help with the healing process. I usually tell families in my practice that acetaminophen, a very small dose, is okay for the first 24 hours. But of course, talk to your physician about that um, just to help minimize pain. And usually you don't need any pain control after that. Right, exactly. And we, we don't want to give it because like we've mentioned before, fevers in babies are really an emergency. And so we would never want to mask a fever or something like that outside of that first day. Yeah, absolutely. 
We also want to make sure that uh, parents don't give any submersion baths. So like putting putting their baby underwater for about a week until it's completely healed. Sponge baths are okay. So usually this heals pretty quickly within a week or so. And reasons that you should contact your physician after circumcision would be for increased bleeding. If your baby doesn't urinate within six to eight hours after the procedure, any significant swelling or redness, some at the site is normal to have a little bit of redness, but it really shouldn't like streak up towards the base of the penis. And sometimes as the skin is healing, there can be some whitish yellow granulation tissue for the first week. This is normal part of the healing process, but there shouldn't be any pus or any drainage. And if you have questions or concerns, you should always reach out to your provider. Thankfully, babies will re- never remember this procedure happening. And many babies sleep through the procedure if you get it done early enough, which is really great. But I also think we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the ethics of circumcision and the ethical dilemma that it does pose sometimes. Right, because it is a surgical procedure and it does result in body modification. And the infant, we can't really discuss it with the infant. They don't have the ability to process that information and (laughs) consent to this. Yeah. And so, you know, this comes up with a lot of things in pediatrics. We allow parents to make informed consent for their child, knowing that in the vast majority of cases, they're going to be acting for what they feel is the best benefit of the child, weighing the health benefits and risks along with their own cultural or religious beliefs. People may wonder if it's reasonable to wait until a child is older so that they can make their own decision about circumcision. Um, While this is something to consider, unfortunately, the procedure gets much more complicated as kids age. So usually it will require general anesthesia in the operating room, um, which has its own big risks. It also has a much longer recovery time. And most cases, once a child is older, will not be covered by medical insurance because they will not see it as like a, a medically necessary procedure. So in the end, this is going to be an individual decision for each family, one that they should be well informed on the risks and benefits of the procedure in a non-biased way. Yeah, and really, I truly believe that whatever decision a family makes, it really doesn't matter in the end. Foreskin, no foreskin, your baby boy is going to grow up happy, healthy. And so, I don't know, in my my personal, you know, unbiased opinion, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you well, you care. They want the family to be comfortable yes, with. Yes, exactly. It. I want either, the family to be comfortable. Either decision is is the correct one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So we hope our discussion today cleared up some of the common questions about male neonatal circumcision. And let's summarize some of the main points. Right. So circumcisions are common procedures in the neonatal period, with nearly sixty percent of infant males being circumcised in the United States. Families may choose to circumcise for various reasons, including perceived health benefits, cultural or religious beliefs, or because of family preference. There are small benefits to circumcision, including decreased risk of urinary tract infections, penile cancers, sexually transmitted infections, and then retractile um, issues like phimosis and paraphimosis. But of course, as with any procedure, there are also risks associated with circumcision, including bleeding, pain, infection, or cosmetic or post-surgical complications. If a family choose to circumcise, they should ensure that they have a provider who is well-trained, will provide adequate pain control, and counsel them on all of the risks and benefits associated. In the end, this is an individual family decision, and the ultimate health of your baby is not likely to be influenced by what you choose to do. Do you have a circumcision joke? It would be difficult not to have a circumcision (laughs) joke. (laughs) Yes, I did. Did you hear about the doctor who does circumcisions on commission? No. Yeah, she works for tips. (laughs) Oh, man, I think... You know, circumcision is one of those things that I'm always kind of grapple with myself. Again, you know, I I really do not have a preference one way or the other. I think I can argue both sides pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Um, But my biggest thing is that, like, if they're my families and my babies in my practice, right, which I consider them all my families and my babies, Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that it's done correctly, that it's done in a safe and sterile way, that it's done to minimize pain for the child. And that's why I do do them in my practice. I think a lot of providers will have their own, you know, 
thoughts or beliefs about whether or not to perform them. And I think fewer and fewer, fewer pediatricians, at least it seems like, are, are choosing to do them in their practice. But, you know, at this stage still, I think that it, it is important to, to be able to provide a safe, safe option for my families. So this is probably going to vary from practice to practice and regionally also. But in your experience, you know, what what proportion of circumcisions do you think are performed in the hospital versus performed after the patient is discharged and in the pediatrician's office? Yeah, I don't have actual data for that. But in my personal experience, I would say maybe 30 percent are are performed in the hospital and then the rest are performed in the office with us. Um, It depends just exactly like you said, was the physician that was working the newborn nursery comfortable with doing circumcisions? And then most will make sure that the baby is not losing a significant amount of weight, which is pretty common if you're exclusively breastfeeding for your baby to lose a little bit of weight or take some time to start regaining. And so I think at least here, our practice is that the majority of them will be done in the office, usually at the two week follow-up weight check, which is a, a really good time to do it, in my opinion. The baby is still kind of sleepy and um, in many cases, like I mentioned, sleep through most of the procedure and, and um, still can heal really fast. That wraps up this episode of Kids Considered. You can find more information on our website, kidsconsidered.ucdavis.edu. Follow us on Twitter at Kids Considered. And Instagram at Kids Considered. If you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. Please call us. Our number is 916-915-3388. Or email us at kidsconsidered at gmail.com. Please rate us on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we hope you will join us for our next podcast. Kids Considered is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital. 